Once again, I welcome uh, Dr. Samarth, the speaker of the day, and all the student friends. I request uh, Dr. Samarth to start with the session. Over to Dr. Samarth. Thank you, sir, and welcome everybody. Uh, last time we talked about various things related to machine learning, and today I actually want to resume from there and finish up a little bit of content that I wasn't able to cover last time. And then I will introduce the homework from that. Uh, I also did not release the homework last time because it was quite big and it took uh, it took us a while to create the homework. And uh, and then in the rest of the time, we will talk about some robotics introduction concepts and get some feedback from you. Uh, and as always, you know, feel free to uh, ask questions at any time. Even right now, if you have any questions from the previous lecture, um, someone emailed me about the notes from last lecture not being accessible and I've fixed that. So I thank you for pointing that out. And in general, the more mistakes you point out, the better these lectures will be. So don't be afraid to do that. Um, Okay, so let me start where we left off last time, where we saw this whole chain rule for deriving gradients of the loss function. And we said that all these neural networks can actually be represented by a computational graph, right? Where each node in the graph is some kind of operation. So it could be this matrix multiplication that is here, or it could be vector addition that is here, or it could be a sigmoid function, which is here. And some operations have some parameters like this W1, B1, some other operations don't have parameters. And once we, find, once we go forward through this computational graph uh, in the direction of the arrows and we finally reach the loss function, we compute the loss function and then we can get the differentiation of the loss function with respect to the output of the last operation, right? And we saw how to do that. For example, if the loss function is just mean squared error, then we can take the differentiation of that with respect to one of its inputs, which is uh, x2 or y over here. And then after that, it's just a matter of chain rule in terms of uh, deriving the gradients of every other thing with respect to the loss function. So for example, we can derive uh, from the gradient of the loss function with respect to x2, we can derive the gradient of the loss function with respect to b2 because x2 equals b2 plus um, this output from the previous layer. So it's just a simple addition. So gradient, the differentiation is going to be one. So the gradient will directly pass from here to the B2. And similarly, it will also directly pass here. Now here in this operation, there is matrix vector multiplication. So that has its own gradient. Um, but as long as every operation is differentiable, then you can keep going back for as many layers as you want. And once you have those gradients, you can do the gradient descent to update those parameters. So today I just want to talk about this special function that we discussed from for images, which is convolution and how that is differentiable. So here I'm showing you two images. Uh, you could say this is the input image on the left and our output image on the right, where output is produced by convolution, right? And the convolution is happening with this two by two filter that I've, I'm showing you here with the different colors. So it's actually the same filter, but the same filter is being uh, slided across the whole image, right? And when you put the filter in the red location, then uh, basically you get the, you get, let's say the output is 
y1 which i'm showing in red on the output image then basically y1 equals if the pixels are here p1 p2 p3 and p4 and similarly the four weights of the filter are w1 to w4 then it's just p1 w1 p2 w2 p3 w3 p4 w4 right so now if we have the gray now remember in the back propagation fun we are going backwards right so we are going from the output to the input so for the output for y1 we have the gradient of the loss with respect to y1 right from that we want to derive the gradient with respect to the p's and the w's so from this equation i think it's quite simple uh, so let's say you want to get gradient with respect to w1 then that would be you just apply chain rule um which is and from this equation you know that there is p1 right and you already know the first term so um that is how you get the gradient with respect to w1 you can get for all the w's as well and similarly if you know the w's you can get the gradient with respect to the p's right so then uh, if even before this you have another image that generated this input image then now that you know the gradient with respect to the p's you can then uh, use that to get the gradient with respect to the pixels of that previous image uh, kind of like a chain fashion now one important thing here is it's the same filter being slided over the entire image right so just how you got from p1 this gradient with respect to w1 you will get it from uh, you will get it also from for example this p uh, pi uh, that is over here because the both of these pixels p1 and pi are below w1 it's just that the filter is slided across everywhere so how should we because we are getting gradients with respect to w1 from all these pixels how should we combine them right so and that is where we get this uh, we we have to use this um kind of multi variable differential differentiation equation so um i just want to show you here uh yeah so it's going to be um, sort of like this so the loss function the loss function is going to be um, let's say from this output image you are somehow calculating your loss function right so your loss function is uh, some kind of function of all these pixels um, y1 y2 up to yn And similarly, you will do your uh, you'll do your back propagation, right? So ultimately, let's say you come back to this input image after doing all the back propagation chain rule. So now your you can say that your loss is some function of our p1 p2 p3 up to pn because i mean that is true right because if the loss function is 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 some complicated function of all the y's then since all the y's are generated from the p's then you can just compose both of those functions uh, for the sake of clarity let me just call this f dash because it's a different function but you have this 
so it's uh, it is a function of man, many many variables now if you want to take uh, the gradient of this loss with respect to w1 right then uh and what is the hmm. and basically the equation becomes uh Just trying to write all the things here. Yeah, okay. So let's say let's pick these two example pixels over here the p1 pixel and the pi pixel and let's say we also have another pixel p uh, pj which is also the common thing among all these pixels is that um, all of them are going to be multiplied by w1 to to get the values of uh, in order to get the values of the y pixels. So you have y1 over here, yi over here, and yj over here. So you have y1 is some function of um, p1 and w1, yi is some function, um, I'll just call this f1 yi is some function fi of pi and w1 right and similarly yj is some other function of pj and w1 so the graph is kind of like this you have w1 um, then it generates uh, y1, yi, yj, etc. Using using this p1, pi, pj, and then you have finally the loss function. So now when you're trying to uh, now when you calculate the gradient of this loss function and you're trying to go, go back, you will get uh, you will get the gradients of loss function with respect to all the y yj gradient with respect to yi and gradient with respect to y1 and the i and then the question is in the next step how how they should all combine right so uh it will actually be the final gradient here will be sort of like um where all these we saw that um uh, this y1 is a function of w1 yi is also a function of w1 yj is also a function of w1 and the whole loss is the function of all these y values so now when you want to do this i think you basically learn this i think in maybe first semester or something because this function has multiple inputs and they all are functions of a common variable so it is going to be uh, basically uh, hmm. 
I think my broadcast has stopped. I'm not sure why. Okay, I think it's back again. So it it is going to be uh, gradient with respect to y one. Um, this plus y i w one plus. Right. Um, so then the so basically the thing is uh, for from all these pixels p1, pi, pj, the gradients that the gradients with respect to w1 that you are going to get, uh, you you will have to add up all those gradients um, according to this equation, right? And you will get the final gradient with respect to w1, and then you will update this w1 is uh, is equal to the old w1 minus your learning rate times the final gradient so uh, that is a common uh, kind of mathematical equation that people have to use when they are getting gradients with respect to these convolutional filters so I think that I just wanted to mention that uh, for the sake of completeness, since a lot of uh, machine learning is using convolutional these neural networks these days. Okay, so then let me share my other screen and just introduce the homework to you. Okay, so here the homework is uh, actually, uh, I made it with some help from another Nirma alumnus, Rakshit. And basically we are going to implement a whole kind of neural network library. And uh, as I showed you in all these computational graphs, there are there is the forward pass and then there is the backward pass. In the forward pass, you're computing the output of all the operations. And then in the backward pass, you're computing all the gradients and updating all the learnable parameters. So here we are taking a well-known data set, which is called the IRIS data set. So it has, some, uh, it has some features about various attributes of flower, like length of petal and things like that. And then there are those attributes are labeled with the type of the flower. So there are three possible types of flowers. And the idea is from the given attribute, you need to learn how to predict the type of the flower. So we are going to do it with a simple neural network. And I just want to kind of uh, show you some of the things. Uh, there are lots of classes in this homework. So I think that's also going to be a good practice for you to do object-oriented programming. But a lot of the code has already been written by us. All you need to do is, uh, for example, there is this uh, lean, there is this layer, for example, this linear layer, right? So all what that does is it does, it multiplies the input by a matrix A and adds a vector to it. So, uh, what you have to do is in the forward pass, you need to kind of write the equation for computing the forward pass and similarly in the backward pass. And just like the last homework, I've provided the solution in kind of like a hidden format. So if you want to check your solution, then you can click here and it will show you the solution. And finally, 
there are two or three different things. For example, that linear layer, then the sigmoid layer, and some loss functions. So once you write the equations for all of those things, then uh, we have written this uh, training code. All you need to do is to just run that cell and it will perform training on this data set and show you the results. So I think it will take some uh, time for, it might take some time to finish that homework, but if you do that, then you will understand a lot of the basics of these kind of neural networks and computational graphs. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so next we will go into robotics. And I know like robotics covers a large, large amount of uh, literature, uh, including from electrical engineering, and then you have all the coding, and then you have mechanical design of robots and things like that. But uh, we actually don't have access to any real robots for this class. so. In this class, I wanted to talk about some mathematical concepts about how to describe and think about a robotic system and the, the motion of a robotic system, the inputs and outputs and things like that. So let me start with the concept of state. The state of a robot is just a collection of variables, the minimum collection of variables that is necessary to describe the locate describe that describe that robot, right? And robot can be uh, anything, any machine that is moving or things like that. You all know what a robot is. Now, uh, what can be in the state? Let's say we have just a say, very simple robot that is kind of this car that is living in a one one dimensional world and it has you know it has there is this origin o and it has its position x along the one dimensional world so in that case you might think uh, let's say you have your position x uh, at time t uh, so actually in this 1D world, the position X at time T is the only state that is required, right? Because if you know that X, then you know exactly where the robot is. So how do you write the equation for this robot? When you write the equation for this robot, what you also consider is what kind of control you are providing. So what is the, um, what is the input to the robot? So it could be some kind of energy that you provide to the motor or things like that, if your robot has a motor. And so the very simple case is, we can write down the equation as um, x of t2 equals x of t1 plus um, this u at t1 times this delta t. So we all know the equation of you know, position and velocity. So it's basically um, x equals x0 plus vt, right? Something like that. So that's basically what I've written down here, which means this u acts as a velocity. And this u, and then this equation, it's this equation is enough to kind of describe the whole robotic system. Because let's say you know the position of the robot at time t equals to zero. Then if you know all the, you know, u1, u2, 
u3 i'm thinking about some discrete time world over here if you know the whole series of u's uh, which are the velocities if you know the series of velocities that you have applied to this robot then you can know the position of this robot at any time t and that is the whole concept of this robot equation that uh, some initial condition plus this equation of the motion of the robot uh, tells you the position of the robot at any time t given the inputs so in this case the input is a velocity but um and this is a this is a linear velocity right so here the kind of the velocity and the motion of the robot they are both in the same same space because they are both linear velocities now imagine if you had if you actually wanted to specify the velocity in terms of rotational velocity because many motors uh, in you know motor controllers and things like that you can set the rotational velocity of that robot then it is quite simple you just do uh, you convert that rotational velocity uh, so any kind of input we are still going to uh, call it as u so we will also call it a u but now this u here is a rotational velocity so let me write down linear here and this is rotational velocity which means if i have this wheel um, and it is moving forward but it has a some kind of rotational velocity u so the linear velocity if if the radius of the wheel is r then we know that the linear velocity is u times r right so here we will do u of t1 times the radius of the wheel times the delta t and this delta t is just t2 minus t1 um, so this is another equation i just i mean the change is very simple but i just wanted to highlight it because this indicates the concept of the input or the controlling variable to the robot being different from the state of the robot so the state is actually the linear position but we are controlling it through the rotational velocity of the wheel so many times there can be a function that con converts from your input space to the state space so here that function is just multiplying by r but in more complicated robots it can be something more complicated now you might think that for example you know if if you want to make this car more realistic then in most cars uh, rather than controlling the velocity uh, it is possible to control the acceleration for example in all these cars that we drive on the roads we have the accelerator which kind of controls the acceleration so how do we represent the equation when the control input is acceleration and not velocity so we also know uh, we also know for example the relationship between like initial and final velocity right where if it's v is the final velocity and u is initial velocity uh, then acceleration is a and the time for which the acceleration is applied so in that case our uh, state space let's see it's going to be uh, is is going to include the velocity somehow right so if x is our position then the velocity is dx by dt but many times in all these robotics uh, you know when you read robotics textbooks and things like that uh, the differentiation with respect to time is usually uh, indicated by just a dot on top of it just for convenience right so then our state includes both because the acceleration first impacts the velocity right and then that velocity impacts our position so 
um, when we when we write uh, when we write that, then it becomes something. It becomes a matrix equation rather than this uh, simple uh, one linear equation. So uh, it you can you can say for example here I wrote it in uh, in continuous time where the t1 t2 can have any kind of uh, real values, but you can also write some of these equations in discrete time where the discrete interval delta t is uh, usually quite small. So we can write that kind of like this, x k plus one and x dot k plus one. It is some function of my x k and x dot k plus my UK. UK here is acceleration. So how how do we convert those things? So let's say first of all we have um, we we know that this second second dimension is related to velocity, right? So this is going to be a two by two matrix where we know that x k plus one is x k plus um delta t times the velocity at uh, uh at instance k right and and then the well the new velocity is going to be uh, is not going to be dependent on the old position so there'll be zero over here but it is going to be dependent on the old velocity so you will have one plus um you will have a matrix here with delta t here and the acceleration is not going to affect the position directly so it's it's going to be kind of like this so when you actually do this matrix multiplication you will get xk plus delta t x dot k and then Right? So you get these two equations. And so this is how you use your acceleration input to control the position of your robot. So one another thing to notice here is if, if the position and velocity is our state, right? So these are state over here. Um, one nice thing to notice is that the next state is a linear function of the previous state and is also a linear function of my control input. And why is it linear? Because it's just a matrix multiplication. Uh, in more and more complicated systems, uh, you might have nonlinear state dynamics, right? Where what that means is that for example, in fact, you can think about a whole aeroplane as a con as a robot, and you know the the state of the aeroplane could be many many things. For example, its uh, its altitude, its uh, angle, its speed. Uh, it could also be um, its rotate its rotational velocity. Uh, like, is it is it rotating too much? Is it turbulent too much? Things like that, and the only control input there is the amount of fuel that you're burning in those two engines, right? So it's a very complicated relationship between that and all the other uh, state variables of the aeroplane. In that case, it's not going to be a simple matrix like this. It, it's going to be some more uh, nonlinear function which cannot be expressed as a matrix multiplication. But I just wanted to highlight this simple example to show that this is a linear um, state equation. And these kinds of equations are very useful in terms of analyzing simple robots. 
because when things are in the form of matrix, uh, you can have various nice properties. Now these are all, you know, these are things you can you can learn in higher level controls courses. Uh, so I'm not going to go into detail there, but just kind of introducing the basic concept of how to describe a robot using a linear equation. Um, so let's take another example. Uh, I think I think most of you will probably have done this without knowing the equations behind it. So, you know, we all make this uh, remote controlled uh, car robots, right? For example, you have a robot that has these four wheels, right? And then you can control the, you design some kind of edge bridge or things like that. And you can make these motors go forward and backward. And based on the forward and backward position, mo uh, movements of these motors, the robot either goes forward or it rotates or it goes backward. You can do all kinds of things. But the interesting thing is we know how to do it intuitively, but what if you wanted to write a program to do this control? So in, for that, you need to actually describe it in mathematical equations. So let's try to do that example. So for simplicity, I'm going to just think of this as one single wheel, right? Um, so, uh, and we will go into, we are going to think about the velocities of these wheels. So V left and V right, VL and VR. Now, we know that if both VL equals VR, then the robot does not rotate, but it just goes, you know, forward or backwards. Now, if VL equals minus VR, so one wheel is rotating forward, another is rotating backward, then the robot um, rotates in place. But in general, if VL is not equals to VR, then the robot does both, uh, you know, translation plus rotation. It kind of goes forward or backward, but also turns slowly. So how do you think about that? Um, let me draw this thing a little bit more bigger. So we have this axis of the robot, and then we have these two V's, right? Uh, and let's just say that, you know, this is going to be VL, VR, and this is the forward direction of the robot. And we have some coordinate system x, y. So we know that the position of the robot is x, comma y. And the orientation of the robot is theta with respect to our coordinate system that we have decided. So now in the general case, when VL is not equal to VR, um, it is going to do some kind of rotation, right? So it's, let's say the robot is like this. Then it will go like this and end up, you know, where this is the forward direction. So in this case, it's traveling in a circular motion. So it is actually part of a bigger circle where there is some kind of center of rotation, C. So for any, the we want to derive the relationship between the velocities of these wheels and the motion of the robot with respect to the center of rotation. So now the idea is we don't know this center of rotation, but we, uh, but we just know that, for example, it is going to rotate with some rotational velocity omega around this center of rotation. Now this center of rotation can be farther away or at infinity also, right? So imagine if VL is equal to minus VR, 
then it is just rotating in place. That means the center of rotation is in the middle of the robot. It's not outside the robot. And if VL is equal to VR, then it's just moving forward. That means the center of, that means it's not a circle at all. It's just a straight line. So that means the center of rotation is kind of at infinity. So we need some equation that captures all of this behavior. So let us just assume some kind of center of rotation Cx, Cy. And we say that this is at a distance r from the center of the robot, right? And the we also know the width of the robot, which we will call L. So what that means, if the if the rotation, if the rotation around this center of rotation is omega, then we know the rotation relationship between the linear velocity and angular velocity, right? Uh, which is linear velocity equals to r times omega the question is what is this r for the left wheel for the left wheel the radius of rotation is going to be uh, this capital r minus the half the width of the robot and for the right wheel it's going to be capital r plus half the width of the robot you see like you can imagine this kind of circle and then another circle like that. So these are circles of two different radius. So we know that omega times L, sorry, R plus L by two, R plus L by two is my right wheel velocity. And omega times R minus L by two is my left wheel velocity. So we have two equations and we know the wheel velocities, but we don't know all the other things. And we know the width of the robot as well. We know L by measurement. So we can solve these equations. So let's say we do um, VR minus VL. So that becomes uh, omega R, omega R gets canceled and it becomes omega L. So that means my omega is equal to VR minus VL divided by the width of the robot, L. I got the equation for omega. Similarly, let's do VR plus VL. So that's going to be Mm. VR plus VL is going to be two omega R. I think that is correct, yes. And we substitute the value of omega from here. So then we get R equals VR plus VL divided by VR minus VL and L by 2. So we got this radius R and we got the angular velocity. Um, let's just check whether this makes sense. We said that if VR equals to VL, then this denominator becomes zero and radius becomes infinite. So that's correct. If VR equals minus VL, then uh, R becomes zero, which is also correct. Since if the center of rotation is at the center of the robot, then the radius is radius of rotation is zero. And in general, if we are not equals to VL, then it will be some non-zero value. So now, uh, we want, just like before, we want to know the effect of 
applying some VR and VL on the position X, Y and the orientation theta of the robot. So let's write down the equation of this. Intuitively, what we need to do is simple, right? We know we know what we need to do. So we now we know the equation of omega. Um, so actually, let's first derive this Cx and Cy from this equation. So similarly, if you kind of draw this axis, then this angle is also going to be theta, right? So um, Cx is going to be x minus r cos theta, and Cy is going to be y plus r cos theta. So, uh, so Ninety minus theta. That angle. Uh, so let's see. This is going to be ninety minus theta, and then this is theta. So yes, you're right. This is going to be ninety minus theta. Um, yeah, so you can basically change the, you can basically say that actually this is theta. So, um, let me just erase that. So what will it be? So if this is theta, then it is x minus r sine theta and y plus r cos theta. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. So what we need to do is from this current position, we need to go to see Cx, Cy, then rotate by this rotational velocity uh, and then kind of go back by this radius r. Um, so let me just write that down in terms of the equations. So my new x, x dash, y dash, and theta dash. What is that? I will first uh, go from x, y to my uh, I will first go from kind of this coordinate because the rotation is about this coordinate system. It's not about my robot. So I will first go from my robot's coordinate system to this kind of CX, CY coordinate system, right? So I will do X, uh, X minus CX, Y minus CY, and I'll just keep theta here. So now once this equation is in that coordinate system, then we know that we need to rotate by this, uh, the, the angle is going, let's say the, let's say we apply these velocities for time delta t, then the angle is going to be, uh, the, the, like the angle of rotation, maybe I shouldn't write it as theta because we already used that symbol, but just some alpha, let's say is going to be my omega times delta t. And we are rotating by that amount. So that becomes cos omega times delta t um, minus sine of that same thing, uh, sine of that same thing, and cos of that same thing. And zero, zero here because our x dash and y dash um, don't directly depend on theta. I mean, they kind of depend on theta through this omega, but we've already considered that. And, uh, and then here, uh, it is going to be, my theta dash does not depend on the position, 
is going to be 0, 0, and 1 here, plus, so what this means is we are, we are now in this coordinate system and we have rotated. We rotated and we are at some new position, so now we need to come back. Uh, so we will again add Cx, Cy, and then we will write this omega delta t here. So that means my theta dash equals to theta plus omega delta t, which we know just from you know simple rotational equations. And then for x dash and y dash, we got this uh, sum function of some function of our x, y, and our control inputs VL and VR. So this is a good example of nonlinear dynamics, right? Because even though we have matrix here, like for example, we have matrix here, but actually our control inputs are VL and VR. And we know the equation of omega in terms of VL and VR, but actually here we have uh, we have all these trigonometric functions, cosine, sine, and things like that. So if you look at it in terms of a function of VL and VR, it is a nonlinear function. So yeah, this is kind of a matrix equation, uh, which is a nonlinear function of our actual control inputs. Uh, and this describes the whole motion of this wheeled robot. So then, uh, once you know by which by applying which velocities, what will what is going to be your next thing, what is going to be your next uh, state of the robot, then you can use that to um, to somehow derive what your input should be if you want to make your robot go somewhere. So all of that is in, in you know, control theory, uh, and that will take many, many lectures to cover. But I think this is the basics of how people describe robots and, and then how they think about controlling those robots. So the next thing I want to describe very quickly. So this was in terms of a wheeled robot, but another kind of robot is you might have seen those robots which are kind of like arms you know so they are they are typically used in car factories uh, to you know pick up various things and put them fit the doors into a car so they are basically arms uh, so they are kind of kind of like this it is rigidly attached to somewhere on the ground or something like that and then it has many uh, solid portions so which are called links and these portions are joined by motors and at the end like the final portion will have some tool so it can be it can be a, it can be a screwdriver or whatever but the idea is these are links and then these are joints and the joint are controlled by motors. So um, the task of the robot is actually that, let's say there is a screwdriver and there is some kind of a, some kind of a uh, some kind of a car that it is trying to manufacture. <laughs> just trying, just drawing a very simple car. Uh, the task of the robot is actually to put this screwdriver at some particular location on the car, right? So we, what we care about is the motion of this screwdriver in 3D. But the way we are able to control this robot is through these motors, which is just like angles of these motors. And that is not in 3D. The angle of a motor is just one dimensional. And here we have, let's say there's a joint at the base, so one, two, three, four, five. So we have our control input as theta one, theta two, theta three, theta four, theta five. Let's say we are able to control directly the angles of all our motors. So from this control input, 
what will be the 3D position, you know, the 3D position of my screwdriver. That is going to be a very complicated function and a very non-linear function because you can imagine it is going to involve sine and cosine of all these angles. Now I won't go into like all the de detailed derivations of this, but let me just work through a very simple example. So uh, we have this robot, you know, it is, um, there is the origin of, of my coordinate system. And there is uh, the first joint, right? like the first link is at an angle theta. Let's say we have a motor here, which can make this link go uh, up and down. So my first link is here. Um, and then I have another joint and then the next link is here. So then I will have um, I will have my let's say x, y, z. So then I will when this rotates, let's say it becomes x, y, z. So this is my coordinate system zero. This is my coordinate system one. This is my coordinate system two. So if I want to write this coordinate system in uh, the relationship between zero and one, what is happening here is it is just rotating around the z-axis, right? So we know, I think we've done this two or three lectures before. We, we can write this whole homogeneous transformation system. Uh, so coordinate system one with respect to zero. Uh, that is going to be, if you remember, what you need to do is you need to uh, you will always have zero, 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 one over here. And then for the translation part, you have to write the translation of the origin of one in this zero. So if it is, if the length of the link is L, then it is, you know, L cos theta, L sine theta, um, And in, term, in the z core, in it's not moving along the z axis at all, so it's going to be zero. It's just rotating around the z axis. If it's rotating around the z axis, then you will have this kind of uh, cos theta minus sine theta sine theta cos theta kind of thing. So this describes this coin system one. And then similarly, you can then consider this one as the origin and then consider the next coordinate system and it has its own angle, let's say phi. And then you will you can write another equation for uh, two with respect to one, which is going to be some other matrix. So then ultimately, so, this whole matrix is a function of theta, and this whole matrix is going to be a function of phi. So finally, you will have one big matrix, which is going to be, uh, let's say the final uh, a final system is S for screwdriver with respect to my base, is going to be T01 times T12 up to TS minus one to TS. So, and this one is a function of theta, this one is a function of phi and all the various joint angles. So ultimately this thing becomes a function of my theta, phi, whatever, all the S joint angles. And it is a big nonlinear function. But ultimately you can express it in terms of a four by four matrix, but all the elements are going to be big nonlinear function of these joint angles. But once you have written down the whole robot like that, then there are various theories which allow you to control that robot. So, yeah, let's, uh, I think that is it. I wanted to discuss some reinforcement learning in this lecture series also. Um, but I just realized I had 
uh, I had given a talk at some other university um, about, it was a one hour long talk about reinforcement learning. Um, because how reinforcement learning is different is in robotics, when you perform some action, like you change one motor, um, let's say here you are, um, instead of the screwdriver, let's say you have a camera at the end of your robot and you're doing some machine learning, all the images coming out from the camera and the machine learning predicts the motion of these joints. So then what you see from the camera in the next step is going to be dependent on which action you predicted in the last step, right? So in the last step, if you predicted that this joint should go up like this, then that means ultimately this whole camera will also move up in the 3D world and you will see something different. Uh, so this actually is very different from the supervised learning that we discussed last time. Because remember, we discussed this uh, independent and identically distributed assumption, where we said that one image is totally independent of the other image. But here, uh, there is all this dependence because the output of one image is going to uh, uh, is going to influence the in the next image that is going to be generated. So in that case, uh, instead of supervised learning, it makes much more sense to talk about uh, this kind of state and action interacting with each other. And reinforcement learning is another kind of machine learning which, uh, uh, which, which is very good at doing these kinds of analysis. So instead of repeating that whole talk here, I will just provide you a link. Uh, it is on YouTube. So if you are interested, in combining machine learning to robotics, uh, then you can you can look at that. And I've also provided some examples of how people um, actually use reinforcement learning in real world. Um, and finally, I just want to talk about one very simple but very famous way to control robots that that is used everywhere in the whole world. Uh, you might have heard about it. It's called PID control, which means proportional, integral, and derivative control. So we saw how, uh, you know, you have some robot and then you have some, uh, you have some control input U and you have some function F that converts this control input U to our state x and this state x is actually what we care about so this state could be the location of the screwdriver and things like that so now what this means is well, controlling basically means if we have some uh, desired state x you know x xd which is where we want the robot to go and then we have some current state uh, xc for current. Then we have some error between those two, right? So we have some error, which is the difference between desired and current state. Control basically means how you use this error to actually calculate this uh, control input value. And we saw all these equations and they work very well if you have if you have modeled the whole system accurately so for example in this wheeled robot system for example we haven't taken into account the slippage of the wheels but we know that in the real world the wheels are going to slip and we also know in the real world that for example if my current wheel velocity is 5 meter per second and then suddenly the next second, I, I give 500 meters per second, the motor is not going to be able to instantaneously go from five to 500 meters per second. It has some torque limit. So uh, there are many, many aspects of a real robot that are really hard to model uh, in these kinds of simple equations. That doesn't mean the simple equations are useless. Uh, they are actually quite useful in analyzing and deriving some uh, roughly correct 
control equations. But there are always some effects in a real robotic system that you uh, that are very hard to capture in these mathematical models. So instead, what this PID control does is it just uh, tracks it just tracks this state. So um, one very simple example is your car, right? Let's say you have your car. Um, and you want to make it go at some particular speed. Let's say you want to make it go at 50 kilometers per hour and you are at 10 kilometers per hour. Then uh, if you are on a straight road, then, then you will start by pressing the accelerator. Then if you reach that speed very quickly, then you will stop that accelerator. But if you don't reach that speed very quickly, then for example, if the car is very heavy or maybe there's the handbrakes are on, or if you're on the slope or something like that, then that that same accelerator value will not reach that speed. So then you will keep increasing the accelerator. You're not doing the calculation that V1 minus V2 divided by delta T. What you are doing is you want some, you have some desired speed and you're looking at your current speed in your speedometer. And then you're just saying, oh, my current speed is smaller than the desired speed. Let me press my accelerator more. And then another, so that is this proportional aspect. You just look at the difference and then you press it uh, depending on what is the difference. So if you want to go from 10 to 100, then you will press it harder compared to if you want to go from 10 to 20. Then another thing is this integral. So integral, what that means is, uh, is that you observe for some time that even though I'm doing this proportional control, I'm not reaching where I want to go. Uh, it could be, it could be, for example, that there is uh, just the weight of your, just the weight of your car is uh, higher than normal or things like that. So typically, um, if we just kind of draw a very simple graph of of this X value, and let's say, we want to, uh, this is time here, and then we want to reach at this xd. Um, and we are here at xc. So when you apply proportional control, like you will go, you will increase linearly, linearly, linearly. Um, but as soon as you reach here, right, as soon as you reach here, your control, you know, this this thing will be equal to zero, and so your proportional control will also be zero, but still your car will have some velocity and acceleration. So it will continue going up. Um, and then you will realize, oh, I've actually over, over done overshooting. So then you start applying proportional control in the other direction. So then you go down like this, and then that kind of keeps continuing like that. So just with proportional control, if you want to do this control, then it, sometimes it becomes difficult and you, you actually observe this oscillatory behavior around the, around the desired point. So what this integral control means, um, so actually let me, let me first talk about the differential control. So this differential control means, um, let me just write this proportional control times E plus differential control. This is just some kind of uh, weightage. Um, differential control times the rate of change of my error. So, you know, like as I'm going here, as I'm going here, my error is keep on, is my error is, uh, my error is decreasing at a constant rate, right? So my, so this value is actually negative, dE by dt, because my, as my time goes ahead, my error keeps decreasing. So uh, since that is going to be negative, um, this will actually uh, provide some kind of damping effect so that it will, this these oscillations will eventually sort of die down like that. Um, and at the same time, you have some integral control, which is the integration of this error over over some past over some amount of past time. 
what that means is like for example uh, if because of some on model error in my system uh, i'm always accumulating error so let's say i'm always kind of like i'm always uh, settling at some constant value but there is some constant offset from my desired point then this constant offset will keep accumulating in this integral and uh, eventually it will get big enough that it will it will it will start pushing my control uh, variable upwards till this integral becomes zero uh, so like this is how so these are all errors in my uh, errors in my state so I will derive my control input by applying this, the inverse of this function times all of these things. Uh, so I think I just wanted to talk about this PID controller mathematically. So you can use it for line following, you can use it for speed controlling of a robot, uh, many, many things when you don't have an exact mathematical model of uh, of your actual robot and there are lots of tutorials on the internet about this uh, and basically when you write this pid controller what you need to do is decide good values of this kp kd and ki uh, and that is called tuning the pid controller but once you have tuned it then pid controller typically works uh, works quite well um, Yes, I think that's that's called PID control. Just for the sake of completeness, I will write this reinforcement learning, and I will share the link of the video link of my talk um, with an email afterwards. But yeah, that's that's it for today. These are some very basic things related to robotics.